The Medal of Honor series, Lessons of Core Values, is a production of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The series sponsors include the Qualix Team, Qualix and Iron Mountain. Qualix Corporation provides support services for the federal markets in the areas of information management and mission-oriented programs. For over 60 years, Iron Mountain has provided full life cycle information management solutions that accelerate digital transformation for Fortune 100 companies, governments, and educational institutions all over the globe. And the Pritzker Military Museum and Library of Chicago, established by Colonel Retired Jennifer Pritzker as a nonpartisan institution dedicated to the study of the citizen soldier as an essential element for the preservation of democracy. This specific program is sponsored through the generous donations of members of the Board of Directors of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. Our host is Colonel Retired Tom Bossler. Tom is a combat veteran of the Vietnam War, a past director of the U.S. Army Military History Institute, a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg National Military Park, and an author of four books on the Civil War. Our guest today is Command Sergeant Major Retired Bob Patterson. Bob enlisted in the Army in 1966, and after basic training in airborne school, he was assigned to first the 82nd Airborne Division, and then to the 101st Airborne Division as they prepared to deploy into Vietnam. After months of training, the unit deployed in late 1967, and the unit's first baptism by fire occurred in early 1968. On May 6, 1968, during combat operations near La Chu, his unit made contact with an estimated North Vietnamese regiment. His platoon sergeant wounded and units advance stalled. The 19-year-old Specialist 4th Class repeatedly exposed himself to fire to protect his fellow soldiers and to open a path forward. For his action that day, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Command Sergeant Major Patterson continued to serve, and in 1990 he deployed with his unit to Desert Shield and Desert Storm. He retired in 1991. Command Sergeant Major Patterson will discuss the value of integrity. Good evening, everyone. It's Tom Bossler here, speaking to you from my farm near uh, Gettysburg, uh, Gettysburg Battlefield. Welcome back to those that have followed us uh, in this series of programs. Welcome to any new uh, uh, people that are are tuning in. Special welcome to uh, uh, Command Sergeant Major Retired Bob Patterson, our guest for tonight. And also I see Colonel Joe Marm over there. Uh, Joe's are gonna be our interviewee next week. And so Joe's sitting in, getting an idea of what's gonna happen, to, happen with him next week. So uh, we're going back to Vietnam uh, tonight uh, and, and next week, but uh, going back with uh, Specialist fourth class uh, Bob Patterson, and a uh, little action that takes place in uh, in uh, uh, May of 1968 that is going to end up with them being awarded uh, awarded the Medal of Honor. Now, as in uh, as in the past programs, um, we ask the uh, interviewee to give us a little background. So, Bob, tell us about uh, your youth. Tell us about growing up. I believe that that uh, all of you Medal of Honor recipients are what, what I call a common man. So what's your background? Well, I was raised in North Carolina, primarily on a tobacco field. Uh, Daddy was a finished carpenter and a part-time sharecropper. Uh, I know exactly what it means to look and smell at the uh, rear end of an uh, old gray mule, because I plowed behind her in enough fields. Uh, other than that, my uh, childhood wasn't anything spectacular. I, I stayed out of trouble. Uh, Mama did give me a few whippings that I deserved. Uh, my, my, I guess my, all of my fun really started when I got into high school. Uh, me and, uh, well, in the ninth grade, me and a friend of mine by the name of Stanley uh, Wyndham, for some reason, if we saw each other in the morning before we skipped class, there was going to be a fight. Now, why, I don't, I have no idea. So all of our illustrious uh, other students would corral us and then guide us to each other until we saw each other so they could watch the fight, and we would get in trouble for it. Uh, started dating a girl in high school, and then I became the proverbial one because she ticked me off on Sunday night, 
and I showed her Monday morning. I had dropped out of high school in the twelfth grade and joined the army, and wow. I started. I started my military career. You know, we read about those kinds of stories, but normally the 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 fellow goes and joins the French Foreign Legion there somewhere. So you went and joined the uh, joined the U.S. Army, and this is 1966. Six, 19, September of 1966. Yeah. So um, how'd that work out for you? Where'd you take your basic training? I took basic training at Fort Bragg, which was Fort ten Bragg. miles from where I was raised. <laughs> then I went. I got my. That's where I got my first Article Fifteen. The first. Oh, yeah, I, no. went to, I went More to than see one. her. I <laughs> went to see her on a weekend pass. And was two hours late getting back. I see. For the folks out there, our Article Fifteen is uh, what we call non-judicial punishment uh, administered at the lower, kind of lower level of the chain of command for minor infractions like coming back on post uh, late. After yep. after being out on pass, so but, but maybe you'll tell us about a couple of the other the, <laughs> a couple of the other Article 15s. So uh, what was your what was your training like? Uh, it really wasn't anything special. Uh, I just other than the Article 15 er period, I, I kept my nose clean. I did what I was supposed to. Uh, of course, I didn't get promoted because of the Article 15, so I left basic training and E1. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. <from there. laughs> well, ultimately, now, what unit are you going to be assigned to in the 82nd? I was, uh, when I first went to the 82nd after jump school, I was assigned to the five, uh, first of the 505th Infantry because my okay. back, I was trained as a, uh, an infantryman. But, and, you're, but you're going to ship out to uh, Vietnam with uh, uh, 101st. Unit, uh, 101st. We, so, yeah, I spent, uh, I spent about, uh, I guess, about four and a half, five months at, at Fort Bragg with the 82nd. Then uh, they started filling up the 101st to send the, the whole division to Vietnam. So a lot of us got picked to uh, be assigned to, uh, reassigned to the 101st. And that was where I got assigned to the Cav uh, Troop. To, to the 2nd Squadron, 17th Cav, second, is that right? 2nd Squadron, the, 17th Cav. That was the ground at that time. The ground uh, recon squadron of, of the of the hundred first. Is that right? Yeah, it was. Well, uh, we had uh, th uh, let's say we had two uh, two troops of ground cavalry, one of air cav. Yeah, so it was mixed mixed squadron. All right, hey Mike, can we have that first uh, view graph slide? I put together uh, some graphics, just kind of uh, spice things up here a little bit. So look at this. There's Spec 4, Robert Martin Patterson. Uh, actually, this is a picture of him a little bit later as a sergeant, but but you get the you kind of get the idea. And of course, there's the 17th Cav. Uh, with the, what your your motto was out front. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. You're going to be out front here pretty shortly. <laughs> yeah. Now on the map, I, I also took. Uh, the idea of, of kind of posting there on the map of Vietnam with the other Medal of Honor recipients that we, we've talked with. And you can see that uh, uh, Jack Jacobs and Sammy Lee Davis, uh, they were down in South, in South Vietnam, down below Saigon in the Mekong Delta. Uh, Gary Biker was up in the Central Highlands uh, in his operation. And so a little further North is going to be where, uh, Bob Patterson and the uh, 2nd Squadron, 17th Cav, are going to be in uh, Tua Tien province, which was the second most northern province of South Vietnam, just below the demilitarized zone of the 17th parallel. And uh, the city of Way would be the, the largest city within that area that you might, you might recognize. This province, uh, to a TN is important in our history of the U.S. Army because it is in this province where more U.S. soldiers are killed in action in this province than any other province in all of South Vietnam during the entire war. And what that tells you is that there was a lot of stuff going on here. There was a lot of fighting going on here. If that many men are going to are going to be going to be killed in action, and, and so. Um, 
we're going to be build up to the to uh, to the story. Tell us, Bob, about uh, about uh, the day. Uh, how the day started for you, the day of the action for which you're going to receive the medal. It started out pretty normal. Uh, woke up, ate bra we were in base camp, uh, uh, Camp Eagle. Uh, went to mess hall, and ate, ate breakfast, and then we got uh, got called in. Uh, I was a squad leader at the time, or no, I'm sorry, a team leader. Uh, we and the platoon sergeant called us all in. Get, he gave us our mission. This is what we're going to do. Uh, and the mission was actually to go out and find a Viet Cong element that had moved into that area. And being scouts, we were supposed to go out, find them, find out what kind of weapons they had, how the morale was and all that stuff, and report it back to uh, division headquarters and not get caught. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't quite work out that way. Uh, we started uh, a sweep of the area. Uh, I guess it was about eight or nine o'clock. And uh, actually we didn't make any contact till right after uh, between 12 and one. Uh, and at that time I had a, an infantry squad that was to my right flank. I was on the right flank of my platoon. Well, that infantry squad got complete, uh, completely wiped out in the initial assault or the initial uh, uh, fire. Uh, the whole platoon was pinned down. Uh, my platoon sergeant had uh, been wounded. He was laying in front of a spider hole. And I can remember uh, trying to maneuver my, my team around to the left so I could get, we could get a better shot at the spider hole and get some rounds into it. Uh, and we got an RPG fired at us. So we moved back around to the right. And at that time, I uh, saw a, uh, a little pagoda, which was, it was kind of a little... Uh, little worship thing thing where they have uh, Buddha and, uh, and all in there and they uh, it had a second floor on it. And I said, well, if I can get up on that second floor, I got a better shot down uh, into that bunker without hitting the platoon sergeant. So I took a law with me and I went up there and I was able to get a good shot. And we were able to get the platoon sergeant back and he's still alive living in uh, Killeen, Texas. So uh, how about that? So just to catch up with, with uh, maybe some of our younger uh, listeners, uh, uh, a law, light anti-tank weapon, 66 millimeter rocket on, a, on an extendable tube that you can fire from the shoulder and it's got an explosive warhead on it. So he's gonna be using that as a tool and, uh, and they make great anti-sniper weapons we found. Yeah, you could overmatch any, anybody that's shooting at with that baby. And so, um, so that's not the that's not the end. There's more, right? No, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I fired the law through the expended uh, canister away. I came back down, and the unit was still pinned down. And all honesty, that's the last of my memory of the day. I don't, don't remember what happened after that. You don't remember. You have to rely on other people. I have to rely just... entirely on what everybody else tells me happened. Now, they said they were all pinned down. Uh, they told me to get down. I grabbed my M16 and a bunch of grenades, ran up into a bunker complex that was had the unit pinned down, uh, knocked out a machine gun bunker, RPG bunker, killed seven, and captured eight. Yeah. And well, the thing is... I remember... It was five o'clock that afternoon, and I was in a 500-pound bomb crater. That was your cover. So, you know, I've heard uh, other Medal of Honor recipients say something to the same effect that you did. You know, when you ask them, well, what does it take to be awarded the Medal of Honor? And they say, well, you've got to do something. Somebody has to see you do it. They have to live to tell about it, and they have to be able to write. And so... I guess that's how all that, all that's going to happen. So yeah. that action, that action, then you're going to basically, I, I'm going to paraphrase. You're going to, you're going to save your platoon. Am I right? Correct. You well, know? actually, the whole unit was pinned down. Yeah, the whole unit was. But pinned once down. I, what, they said once I opened that area up, the rest of them were able to uh, move through it. Move, move on, move on through the uh, resistance of the of the enemy. So that is, uh, where did you find, where did you find the courage 
the courage to do what you did? Oh, gosh, I have no, I, I think we all have it within us. It just has to, uh, uh, just has to be something that brings it out, a reason for you to do something like that. I, I don't know. I don't know if I had that courage or not. Were you scared? Did you think about it? I didn't know. I really didn't I, think about it at all. I just, I, I remember reaching down, grabbing my M16 and going blank. Well, you know, I, I, I've said this before on this program, and it bears repeating, I think, is that I believe, and I think a lot of us who have uh, been in combat believe that that fear is a, is a reaction. It's, it's an instinctive reaction to a situation in which we could all, in all likelihood be, be severely hurt, if not killed. So fear is a reaction, but courage is a decision. Courage is a decision by the individual to take action, to overcome. If there's any fear, it's going to be overcome by courage. Maybe there's no fear there, fear there to start with, but you're going to take action. And uh, that's, uh, that's a decision that the individual makes. And, uh, you know, I can imagine that your buddy's sitting there, and, and they were probably trying to tell you, weren't they, hey, Wow. No. Don't go out there. Were they trying to tell you that? Well, that's what I'm told is that I will all holler and get down, just get down, just get down. Well, so that's, uh, that is uh, very remarkable. So you're, you're not going to leave. I mean, you're going to, you're going, you're going to receive this, uh, this medal later on, but you're going to stay uh, in, uh, in the unit. And then you're going to yep. rotate, you're going to rotate uh, back to the world, as we, as we called it back in those days, back, back home. And so what was that like going back home? Uh, well, every, I, I, to me, it really wasn't. We flew from uh, Saigon to uh, San Francisco Travis Air Force Base uh, on a uh, Tower Airlines uh, and uh, got off. You know, they immediately took us to a barracks complex where we were assigned an area, uh, given a chance to get a good hot shower. And they gave us clean, clothes, clean new clothes to put on. And then after that, the next morning, you, you went through uh, processing uh, back into back states, processing back stateside. And then uh, you were given a plane ticket home. Uh, I, uh, duffel bag and all, went from Travis Air Force Base to San Francisco, walked straight through the airport, never got spat on, never got called a baby killer or anything else. Uh, got on a plane and flew from San Francisco to Fedville, North Carolina. You're going to uh, you're going to decide to stay in the Army. Correct. And uh, in fact, uh, you were in the in the first Gulf War, right? I was. Yes, sir. yes, sir. And uh, that is uh, that's a pretty long length of service. We're going to come back to that here in just a little bit. A uh, reminder to our audience, I pray he'll just uh, remind you at the beginning, but we're going to go to a question and answer period here in about, uh, oh, maybe 15, 20 minutes, we'll go to questions and answers. So if you've got any questions you want to ask uh, Bob, then please go to the, the, uh, the quest to the Q&A section down there on the bottom of the screen and type in your questions and uh, Mr. Tim Nelson is going to re uh, retrieve those for us. And so we'll finish the last 15, 20 minutes of, of this program with a, with a Q&A. So send your questions in now so that Tim can get, the, get them sorted and prepared for us. So um, I always thought that, that, that staying in the Army after coming back from Vietnam was, was a significant uh, uh, advantage to me over, over other guys that, that did not, that correct back into civilian life. You feel the same way? That, that being it, it, was a, it was an advantage to me because uh, when I re-enlisted the first time I had made E5, I was first newly married uh, and I got to look into, okay, wh what do you have waiting for you if you decide to get out of the army? And the only thing I could think of was that damned old gray mule. That mule. <laughs> and back, I said, no. Back into that better, mule. Better stay where you're at. And I just, from that, I just every time I came up for enlistment, no question to ask. I did it. So, you became a drill sergeant, is that right? Correct. When I came back from Korea, I was assigned to uh, drill on drill sergeant duty at Fort Bliss, Texas. Well, I've 
I was assigned at Fort Bliss, Texas as well. I was out at McGregor Range. <laughs> you know where that is, right? Yeah, oh yeah. I was the I was the OIC officer in charge of all those ranges out there for the for the infantry uh, basic training and all that. So, yeah, those were an yeah, interesting time. But uh, I think we may have run it. Well, you you were at McGregor Range Complex, right? Because yeah, that, that's where we took all of our trainees for marksmanship and everything. So yes, we may did. have run into each other out there. Well, your guys were blowing my target frames all up. <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. they were. <laughs> I, I had a crew making making target frames. So, well, the my point of, of asking you to go in that direction is this: is, is that then you're going to continue to give uh, good service to the country, and and because you're going to be training our soldiers. Yes, sir. Is that, is that right? So, how how do you feel about that? About training the soldiers? Yeah. Well, the way I got to Fort Bliss, I came back from Korea. I was going, I had spent six years straight on in, in the 82nd, had uh, injured my back on a jump and got reassigned, uh, went to Korea and was on the way back and they were sending me, me right back to Fort Bragg and I said, uh, ain't, with my back messed up like it is, there's no way I'm going to be jumping out of airplanes. So I went up to the Pentagon or to uh, D.C. to uh, Hoffman Building here, that, where they had the enlisted records yep. and talked to them. And they said, well, we can put you on drill sergeant duty at Fort Bliss, Texas. I'll take it. Because I was thinking, okay, you're an E6. You want to make E7. You've got to have, you got to get some schooling under you. So drill sergeant school will be a great one to put under your belt. My only problem is I, I didn't realize I'd already been selected for E7. <laughs> so, <laughs> I always had things like that happen to me. Yeah, back, and, back right up, back right up on you. Um, and so, and you're, after you receive the, 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 the Medal of Honor, we're going to get to that here in a minute, but let's, let's move on just a second beyond it. Um, in the in the remaining time in the Army, did the people around you know that you were a Medal of Honor recipient? And if so, what was their reaction? Sometimes they did, other times they didn't. I was in one, uh, well, in the 82nd, uh, I'm, my platoon sergeant, who was my platoon sergeant when I went to Washington, D.C., was selected to go down from the 17th Cav, 1st to 17th, down to 1st or 504th to be the headquarters company first sergeant and he came back to me a, a few days later and asked me to come down there and be his s and platoon sergeant sport and transportation platoon sergeant and i agreed and uh we went down there and i was i was in now sergeant simmons he knew it but he didn't tell anybody not even about the company commander and so i was in that unit for about six months before anybody ever knew it and the only way they found it out was we had an IG inspection. And my platoon was selected to be the dress, the, the dress green uh, yep. platoon. So I got them ready and I'm standing out there and here comes Colonel Dillon, the 82nd Airborne Division IG, walks up in front of me, looks at my lieutenant, says, Lieutenant, release your platoon. Captain, I'll see you in your office. <laughs> <laughs> and that guy hated me from that day on. That captain hated my guts. Oh my, that's something. That is yeah. that's something. Um, speaking of, of of men that you served with, um, tell us about your squadron commander, uh, Julius Beckton. Oh, oh, Colonel Beckton. God, I love that man. Uh, Colonel Beckton actually grew up to become the first black three-star general in the United States Army. Yes, he did. When I, when I had him, or when he had me, I was in Vietnam. And uh, Julius gave me my, the last of my three Article 15s. The last? In, in, the last one in Vietnam. And when I reported to him for it, he started laughing. And I, st I learned to keep my mouth shut. But I was looking at him thinking, what does he find so damn funny about this? Ran into him years later at um, 
at Fort when I was uh, uh, on grill sergeant duty at Fort Bliss. Uh, no, no, it was after after that. Uh, it was after I made sergeant major, and uh, I ran into him at a parade in Austin. And I looked at him. Uh, we were talking, and I said, "Sir, can I ask you a question?" He said, "Sure." I said, "You remember that article 15 you gave me?" And he started laughing. I said, just what did you find so damn funny? He looked at me and said, Sergeant Major, I am the only commander that can say he recommended a person for a Medal of Honor in the morning and gave him an Article 15 in the afternoon. <laughs> oh, that's really, that's really a great story. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I think uh, most of us remember when significant things in our life take place. We remember where we were when that significant thing took place. Where were you 51 years ago tomorrow? 51 years ago tomorrow? Today's the 8th, so that'd be the 9th of October. 1969. Mike, go to the second slide. What? Was that what, was that these? Because I keep getting the award date mixed up. Yeah, you were the, you were the guy on the left. Okay, there you go. <laughs> You were, you were the guy on the left. This is uh, the Medal of Honor presentation, October 9th, 1969. And there's four of you lined up behind the president. There were four guys who uh, were uh, received the Medal of Honor on the same, the same ceremony. And there is uh, Sergeant Bob Patterson on the left end of the line. And the, then they, you've got uh, James Sprayberry, J uh, Jack Jacobs, who we interviewed earlier in this series of programs. And then uh, Pat Brady, um, those were the four uh, Medal of Honor recipients that day. Tell us about what were you thinking uh, as this whole ceremony is taking place? I, 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 I was just, I, you know, I'm, I'm a country boy from a tobacco field in North Carolina. And I'm standing in, in the White House with president, the President of the United States. I'm just total uh, awe. I have no idea what was going through my head. All I know is I was standing there and I couldn't believe it. Were you all nervous? I, all I could do was just look out. And just couldn't uh, too bashful to look people in the face. So I was just looking out uh, at uh, the feet of the, of the front row. <laughs> my understanding was it was a pretty big crowd out there. Yeah, we were in the Rose Garden uh, for the ceremony. So yeah. there, were, there were quite a few people there. Well, that was uh, that was really a significant event for you. Um, so you're going to continue to serve, uh, serve in the Army, and oh. then you're going to retire in 1991. Mike, last 90, slide, please. 92. 92. 92. And so that is a significant uh, length of service. And uh, there you are. Um, I have that so, stupid look on my face. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like that picture? I should have cleared it with you before I put it up there, I guess. Yeah, that's okay. No, that's okay. The one I really don't like is the one where I've got a mustache. Now, to talk well, about you, ugly you know, picture. Uh, that's, that was on my system as well. And I thought, no, you know what? I'm going to go with this other one. <laughs> but uh, there you are with the... Uh, the Brave Rifles of the 3rd uh, Armored Cav Regiment, and that was your unit uh, Correct. Uh, back then. And so you're going to put in um, a significant years of service, rising to the top. I mean, the senior enlisted grade in the Army, going from private <laughs> as a result of the first Article 15 <laughs> to Command Sergeant Major. That is significant. I mean, that is... Uh, that's not easily. That's not easily done, and I would think that uh, in that process, uh, they're going to continue to promote uh, a individual that shows integrity. Integrity is what we wish to talk about tonight. Is one of the uh, core values of the Medal of Honor. So not only integrity uh, in yourself, but integrity in uh, the people that you're working with, your your commanders, your peer group, and your subordinates. 
uh, tell us a little bit about what you what you're thinking when we say the word integrity. What's on your mind? Well, I do I do a lot of talking to school kids, and uh, I and I talk about integrity. To me, integrity. Everybody has assets, and we got basically all have the same assets. And one of those assets is your integrity. You're the only one that can mess with that. You, you're the only one that can do anything with that integrity. Nobody else can change it but you. And your integrity is the one thing you never want to jeopardize, jeopardize because if you do, you'll play heck getting it back. Uh, yeah, your honesty. Uh, cavalry scout goes out, they find the enemy, uh, find out what all they got, sneak back, and then report it to division so the division can make up a battle plan. Well, if I go, if I come back, and this is the way I put it in my head, if I come back after that, off that mission and I tell the division, well, they got a little uh, six-man squad out there and uh, they don't have very much rice and they got bows and arrows. <laughs> and that goes to the division. The division commander is going to plan his combat mission or his combat attack based off the information I'm giving him. So if I go back there and I lie to him, and tell him something like that, then I'm going to get a lot of guys killed. And that's the one thing I could never, uh, I'd never be able to live with something like that. Right. But integrity yeah. to me is one that's, the one asset that is yours and only you can ru ruin it. And at the same time, um, we expect integrity from those that we were working with mm -hmm. that were, um, both superiors, peers, and subordinates, as I said, that, that that is part of our makeup as soldiers is we have an element of integrity that's not always found in other people, but within ourselves, we certainly uh, aspire to be a person of integrity. So in addition to your uh, uniform service in the Army, um, you've got uh, quite a few years of service to the to the soldiers by way of the Veterans Administration. Am I right? Correct. I just, uh, I served uh, worked for the VA for 17 years after I retired. 17 years, sir. And so you add all that up. So that that's your that's your adult life, right? Correct. Well. We can continue to march on, can't we? Aren't you vice president of the, of the Medal of Honor Society? Yes, sir, I am. And you've been there in that role how long? Uh, well, actually, I'm. I'm. Uh, you can only be uh, vice president for two consecutive tours terms, and they're two-year terms. I had finished up my second term, and I was not even elected vice president. I didn't run for anything after the after my second term, and the guy who was uh, elected vice president, uh, he started having some issues that he, he needed to deal with, and he decided, hey, I can't be the vice president and deal, deal with these issues. So he resigned from the position, and the current president called me and says, hey, Bob, so-and-so uh, 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 resigned, and I, I need a, a vice president. Would you consider finishing out his term and because it wasn't my term it was his term uh we determined that uh, I, if i did we would not be violating our bylaws so that's how i'm doing this third term well there you are so we picked the guy with integrity again to keep uh, keep moving forward with this well it's been it's been great uh it's been great talking to you tim uh get yourself ready we're about ready to switch over to some Q&A, questions and answers. And uh, Bob, thanks for joining us tonight. It's been great talking with you again. And Joe, are you over there? Can you hear me? Joe, I guess not. I see his, I see his smiling face. Tim, are you there? I am, sir. Can you see me? I can see you. Outstanding. Thank you, Colonel Bustler. However you want, I'm uh, Tim Nelson and I am I'm honored to serve as the Chief of Development for the Army Heritage Center Foundation. And I'm gonna be asking uh, 
Sergeant Major Patterson some questions today that you've submitted through the Q&A session. I encourage you to keep typing there, so uh, I'll keep looking as well. Uh, we've, we've got a few questions, so if we can't get to them all, we're going we're gonna to do the best we can. Sergeant Major, it's uh, good afternoon, sir. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, before we get started, I see that uh, great medal around your neck. Thank you, sir, for, for wearing that. It is an honor to see it. Um, I have some questions. Let me get started. Um, so Sarah, an ROTC student, asked uh, that she's taught that soldiers uh, must possess integrity. In fact, it's one of the, the, uh, the seven keys of being a, a soldier. As a leader, uh, how best can you uh, be an example of integrity to your soldiers? How can, how can you, as a leader, how can you be an example of integrity? Uh, the way you deal with them, uh, uh, you can't, uh, you're going to get crappy missions or de details or whatever. And you have to share them with everybody equally. And if you start uh, deviating and having your friend that you just really wasn't like, for him to be out there burning that stuff, so you're going to let him slide. Your other soldiers are going to see that, and they're going to start tagging you. So you got to be fair and honest to that with everybody. Good, good. Thank you. Um, Mika uh, Ask, what word of advice would you give uh, to future leaders that are going to be in the military? What are some things you would advise them of? As officers or enlisted? Just says leaders, so let's say both. Uh, well, I always told my NCOs, treat your soldiers right, punish, uh, reward them when they deserve it, punish them when they, do, uh, when they deserve that, treat them equally, and treat them, all, treat them like you want to be treated. Remember all the things that happened to you when you were that rank that you just purely hated Make sure you don't do that to your soldiers. And if you want to uh, work, don't worry about your career, because if you take care, care of your soldiers correctly, they'll make you, your career for you. Now, officers, uh, best, uh, I like the first, second, uh, first, uh, second lieutenants, ones I really like, because they were young enough you could still mold them and shape them. And yeah. as an NCO, part, uh, even though the officers train their officers, uh, NCOs also train lieutenants, and I love doing that, working with that new lieutenant. Thank I you. don't, I don't often interrupt on <laughs> these questions and answers, but I've got to say that uh, the one man that is probably the most significant in my development as a commissioned officer, as a lieutenant, was Master Sergeant Bainey, and he did exactly what Bob said is that he had uh, a fresh piece of clay that he's going to mold into what he wanted it to be as a second lieutenant. And that's over 50 years ago when Master Sergeant Bainey was training me to be a lieutenant. If you can remember a guy's name that long, it must have been significant. I'm going to Shut up. Well, the, the best one I, the one I remember the most was, uh, was Lieutenant Martinez. I had just made E7 and it was assigned to a terrible overseas tour. It was just absolutely terrible every morning in Hawaii. <laughs> and I went to my unit and I met, met him and he, uh, he was fresh, fresh in and everything. And he had been trained as an officer, so he knew what he was supposed to be doing. He just didn't know how to go about doing it. And I got to train him on how you do those things. Yeah, Stanley. Yeah. So uh, Stanley wants to know, and so do I actually, uh, what years were you at Fort Bliss? At Fort Bliss? Yeah. I, I did a total of nine years on Fort Bliss. And there was nothing blissful about Fort Bliss. Uh, I was there for two uh, for uh, two and a half years as a drill sergeant. Uh, let's see, I came back from Korea in 76, so seven, 76, 77, 78, 79. I went to Hawaii 
for three years. I came back from Hawaii uh, in 81, back to Fort Bliss, uh, got promoted to first sergeant, uh, stayed at Fort Bliss until, uh, as a first sergeant, uh, till um, June of 84. Then I went to Sergeant Major's Academy at Fort Bliss, left Fort Bliss in January of uh, 80, no, no, yeah, I left there in January of 86 and went back to Hawaii uh, to ROTC duty in Hawaii. That was really terrible duty. Oh, <laughs> <no. I'm bad. laughs> Get up every morning and go to the university. Yes, terrible. And then I promoted myself out of, out of uh, a job because I made command sergeant major. And at that time, the uh, ROTC detachments, well, they had just... Uh, just uh, got authorized uh, command sergeant majors because they just established cadet corps or cadet command. Cadet. And uh, the regiment, uh, I was in the fourth region. My uh, regional commander was Colonel, Cor uh, Colonel Cor uh, oh, heck. Uh, dang, I can't remember his name, but he sent his chief of staff, who was Colonel Quartz. Uh, he knew I had been selected, uh, Colonel French. Uh, and so Colonel French sent Colonel Quartz to Hawaii because he knew I had been selected as command, to be a command sergeant major to ask me if I wanted to be his command sergeant major. Now, he's a, he's a brigadier general at this time. So uh, my first slot as a command sergeant major under a general, hell yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, Actually, Cadet Command Sergeant Major was the one that blocked it. So I went up to the 25th Infantry Division as a Battalion Sergeant Major. There you go. So uh, we'll talk offline, but I was I was at Bliss in 76, again in 79, and again in uh, 83, 82, 83. So we'll, we'll and at McGregor Range as well. So <laughs> well, when I got when I uh, um, let's see, the so second yeah. My second tour, I was the first sergeant of uh, L Troop uh, 3rd ACR. And uh, we went to gunnery and we set the mountain range on fire. <laughs> and it was headed over the hill into uh, Black Sands. <laughs> Must have been something, brother, because there's nothing out there to burn but rocks. Okay. Um, so we have, um, we have one from Captain Blake Friend. Thank you for submitting that, Captain. Uh, who asked, and, I, and I'll, I'll modify this a little, what was, uh, where were you when you found out you were going to receive the, the Medal of Honor, and what was your reaction when you re were told that it was going to be, that you were going to receive it, sir? I was at Fort Bragg, uh, and the uh, A Troop, uh, 1st and 17th Cav. Uh, George Simmons was my platoon sergeant. He came to me and said, Sergeant Patterson, uh, you need to go over to Corps Headquarters protocol office and meet a major and told me the major's name. So I go over there and he wouldn't tell me what it was about. So I go over there and I meet this major and the major looks at me and says, Sergeant Patterson, you're going to Washington, D.C. And I looked at him and I said, you're out of your damn mind. I have no reason to go to Washington, D.C. And that's when he told me, oh yeah, you're going to receive the Medal of Honor and I'm going to do what? Wow. And that's how I found out. Wow. Wow. Um, we've got a couple of more questions about um, about uh, integrity. So I'm going to try to, uh, from, from Kay, Katie, I believe this is, or has asked, have you ever been in a situation where you witnessed or was in charge of someone who, who did, had, who, who in your mind uh, had some sort of integrity violation? Uh, whatever that, whatever you would feel that would fall under. If so, how did you deal with it? Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it depended, uh, like there were some, uh, I had a troop commander that uh, he, uh, he disagreed with my tactics. So he decided he was going to cut me points on my NCOER for my tactics. Tactics aren't even on NCOER. And 
because we the NCOs don't get graded on tactics. So we he, he was but he was dead set he was going to take those points away from me. Well, that would have messed me up for getting promoted. So he and I had I actually with him I just went in and sat down and talked talked to him and was able able to convince him after I finally looked at him and said, well, sir, my tactics have been proven in combat. Have you yours? And he gave him, okay, gave him my points back. I, I've had platoon sergeants that, uh, other uh, platoon sergeants that were my peers that uh, one in particular we were on gunnery and he and I were running for high gun, uh, high tank. And he fired his last round and everybody in the world saw it sitting at the front of the berm burning. So he didn't hit the target. It was no way because it had went through that target. And but he uh, when the uh, greater says uh, said he got a hit, uh, he accepted it. And I just uh, that's I just lost all respect for him. And just had, I had to stay away from him for quite a while because I wanted to do something I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> Um, here is a, a question you said, this is anonymous. You said you didn't remember most of your actions, uh, from that day. Do you, re were you, did you happen, were you injured? And, 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 and what about your fellow soldiers? Were there a lot of injuries in that battle? Well, I don't know how many got medevaced out or taken out because I don't, you know, I don't remember the contact. Uh, I know when I came to, uh, we went a 500 pound bomb crater and I was holding another soldier that had been shot in the head. Uh, uh, I got uh, superficial wounds is the best way to explain it. Cause I got wounded three times over there and never got p past a platoon medic. <laughs> so it went very serious. Thank you. What was the major, major differences in the Gulf War and Vietnam in your, in your mind? What was it? What was the differences for you? Uh, I really, really, really liked the way General Schwarzkopf ran it. Because he would not let any news media out around any of his soldiers. I can't tell everybody, yeah, he kept them in, in a dark room in Riyadh and fed them um, bull crap. Just what he wanted them to know. And he, he kept them there. He would not let them go out. And Vietnam, you know, every time you turn around, there's a photographer there with a camera wanting to take a picture. And it really, yeah, you stop and you take the picture and everything, but you don't want to. You got, you got things on your mind, and having a picture taken ain't one of them. Um, this is a long question. I don't want to mess it up, so I'm going to try to read the whole thing. This is from Cole. Uh, Cole is an ROTC, excuse me, Air Force ROTC cadet. And uh, he is taught that the Air Force Corps values integrity is first and service before self excellence in all we do. Ex excuse me, integrity is considered the forefront of these core values. Um, you've kind of answered this before, but for Cole's sake, maybe revisit it. Do you have, as he goes into the service, do you have any advice on how he can instill his fellow cadets with integrity? And he closes it by saying, thank you for your service. First thing you do when you get to your first unit, Find the best NCO that you have in that unit and get under his wing. Let him train you, and then you pass that on down to your, your peers. That's the best piece of advice I can give him. Excellent. Excellent. What was – did you spend much time with President Nixon, and what was he, what was he like? Well, we spent about 20 minutes with him in the Oval Office, uh, the four of them, four of us, a major, two captains, and a little E5. And uh, I'm still too embarrassed uh, to say a word. Uh, but we sat there and we talked with him for, uh, for about 20 minutes. 
Uh, very nice guy. Very, very easy to talk to. It was like talking to your best friend. And that's, uh, we, we were given, at that point, we were given a choice. Uh, we could stay there in D.C. for another week at the Army's expense, or we could fly out to Houston where the society was having this uh, convention. We decided we'd fly to Houston. So the president looked at us and says, here, take my plane. So I tell everybody we stole this plane. <laughs> wow. As, yeah. as you look at this, as you look at this, at the future of this nation um, and its military, what are your hopes uh, for, 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 the, for that the future, uh, I guess, the future of the nation's military? What's your hope uh, for the future of the nation's military? Oh, okay. Uh, hopes for, uh, I would like for Washington, D.C. to really realize how valuable soldiers are to them and take care of them like they should be. Excellent. Excellent. And, you know, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to close this with a, 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 it's my own question. So I'll, 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 I'll do this and thank you all for submitting these questions. Can you tell me, you know, a lot, obviously um, the battle was, was unbelievable and, and, and uh, wonderful and long and successful career, Sergeant Major. How, how, uh, uh, what are some of the other things that have touched you in life uh, uh, as as you've went on, when you've had so many high points, if you will, to com compare it to, what are what are some of the things personally that have that have driven you and mattered to you over over the recent years? Ah, uh, I guess uh, the b biggest one would be the way my sons turned out. I had two boys, and I was never home, so my wife was the one who raised them, and. Uh, uh, it was very, very seldom I ever had to discipline. The only time I, uh, I had to uh, do any discipline was when uh, they started about them off at the mom. And then I had to get involved. And uh, they didn't like that very much. Uh, so they kept, normally kept their mouths pretty clearly shut. But uh, they've turned out to be two great young men. Uh, they've never gotten into trouble. Well, Anthony got into a little trouble when he got his driver's license, but all kids do that. But other than that, they've never been in any trouble. Uh, they uh, have never been involved in any kind of drugs or anything like that. And I, I'm really proud of what she did in raising those two boys. Wow. What a Without my help. What a testimony. Well, Thank you again, Sergeant Major, and, and, and I appreciate you so much. And uh, and I'll be talking to you soon. And and and, and Colonel Bossler, to you as well, and to all of our attendees uh, today. I'm sure that you will agree that this was a very special uh, program. Um, before I turn it back over to you, Colonel Bossler, we hope uh, that you'll all come back next week and attend the next session in the series. Uh, we will be honored to host um, uh, a, a, a wonderful session next week with Joe Marm, who you see up in the, in, the, in the corner there. Colonel Marm, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon, my friend. Um, and we'll be talking about sacrifice. Um, so uh, that'll be next Thursday at 5 o'clock. And again, thank you all. And uh, good seeing you, Sergeant Major. Colonel Bossler, back to you, sir. Thank you, Tim. Well, um, Sergeant Major, thank you for, for uh, joining us tonight on this program. Uh, very insightful uh, background you have, very, very exciting background that you, that you live, and sharing all that, all that with us. And, and as we, you know, part of the mission here of uh, uh, the Army Heritage and Education Center and the, and, the, and the foundation is that we tell the Army's story one soldier at a time. And tonight, it was your story, Commander Sergeant Major. And so we're pleased to do that. Uh, next week, we're going to go into the Idrang Valley with Joe Marr and uh, have a uh, 
maybe some firsthand accounts, we hope, Joe, of uh, the first major, uh, one of the first major ground battles uh, in, the, in the Vietnam War and the experience, uh, in which uh, a tremendous book, if anybody want to read ahead, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, a tremendous book. And uh, of course, there was a movie, a movie to follow. So if you want to prepare for next week, um, have at it. That's great. And in fact, I just rewatched re the movie the other night and, uh, and I, I've, I've got the book on uh, my desk. So uh, see you all next week. Same time, the same station. Good night.